Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome all to ICAP Grand Rounds. The topic of our Grand Rounds today is the first malaria vaccine, current progress and next steps. I'm Wafa El Sadr, I'm the ICAP Global Director, and gives me great pleasure to um, introduce our speakers and to share with you our agenda for today's uh, webinar. As you can see here, we will start with some welcome introductions and, um, and also, uh, I would ask you all to please put your questions to the panelists anytime during their presentation. If you can go back one slide, please. You can put your questions anytime to the panelists and discussants uh, using the Q&A box. And to let you know that this webinar, as always, is being recorded and the slides and the, and the webinar recording will be posted on the ICAP website. And then uh, we're happy to share with you that we are offering a French interpretation today. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And here are the instructions to, uh, to, in order to um, get to the French translation. You can see at the bottom of your screen, a little globe that says interpretation. Uh, please uh, go to that little globe and click on it. And then you will see, uh, you can then uh, choose a French as the language, if that is the language you'd like to hear this webinar presented in. Just keep in mind that this is only uh, can be done uh, if you use, uh, can, uh, you cannot listen to the language interpretation if you're using dial-in or call or the call-in audio, uh, phone audio features. Next slide, please. So now it gives me great pleasure to to, to introduce very briefly our two uh, eminent uh, presenters today. I'll start first with a brief presentation of Dr. Ngawia Magafu. And uh, Dr. Magafu is a medical doctor. He's a public health specialist and epidemiologist with over 20 years of experience uh, in clinical practice, as well as academics, research, infectious disease, and health system management. He currently serves as a technical officer on the malaria vaccine program at the World Health Organization at the Afro Regional Office in Brazzaville, Congo. Before joining the WHO in January of 2020, he was the head of disease intelligence and surveillance division of the Africa CDC at the African Union in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where he was responsible for leading and coordinating uh, the institution's uh, public health infectious disease surveillance programs. Now, throughout his career, he's had extensive experience in technical assistance to providing technical assistance to ministries of health, as well as strengthening health institutions in Africa, in Asia, and the Caribbean. He's worked in many, many different countries uh, all over the world. He holds a medical degree from the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, a master's in public health degree from Belgium, and a PhD in infectious disease epidemiology from Nagasaki University in Japan. Our second speaker today is Ms. Eliane Führer, is a technical officer in malaria vaccines, also at the World Health Organization's Immunization, Vaccines, and Biologics Department, where she is supporting the implementation and evaluation of the world's first malaria vaccine in, uh, conducted in Ghana, in Kenya, and in Malawi through the Malaria Vaccine Implementation Program. She also has extensive experience in public health, over 15 years of experience, and she has, is very passionate about immunizations and vaccines and efforts to ensure equitable access uh, to life-saving uh, interventions for public health. Mm -hmm. Before joining WHO in 2016, she worked in various uh, public health positions, including at eHealth uh, Africa in Sierra Leone, as well as also uh, working uh, previously in WHO in Albania and Geneva on public policy and innovative financing for health and immunization. She has degrees in control of infectious disease from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and in international relations, and is now pursuing a Doctor of Public Health program at the London School. So I, let's move on to our presentations first, and remember to please put your questions into the Q&A box. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Magafu, who's going to start first, and then to be followed by Dr. Führer. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Wafa, for the uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank ICAP uh, on behalf of my colleague, Elian. 
uh, for having us. Uh, this is a, a great opportunity for us to share information about the malaria vaccine uh, that is being rolled out in uh, different countries at the moment. So as it has been said, the title of the presentation is the first malaria vaccine. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, current progress uh, as well as the next steps regarding this vaccine. Next slide. Now the outline of the presentation is as you see uh, on this slide. First, we're going to look at, briefly look at the malaria disease burden. Then the WHO recommendation for the use of the first malaria vaccine. And then we will go into results and lessons learned uh, from the malaria vaccine implementation program. And then we will uh, discuss briefly the malaria vaccine rollout, uh, including progress, challenges, and opportunities. And then lastly, a quick uh, look at the malaria vaccine pipeline. Next slide. Now, uh, Malaria is still a major cause of childhood illness uh, and death, in particular uh, in Africa. The graph that you're looking at at the moment uh, presents global trends in malaria death over a period of 20 years, starting from 2000. Uh, the blue line, uh, the blue curve that you see, the graph represents the death in the WHO African region. And then in what I would call brown uh, represents the global figures. Now, starting from the year 2000, you see that uh, uh, the number of deaths, uh, you know, declined steadily up to the year uh, 2015 or around that time when it stagnated. Uh, it has been, uh, you know, like that for several years, up to 2021, you see stagnation there. Now, the decline in the number of deaths and cases was due to the investment that was made at that time, you know, investing in the different methods of controlling and preventing the disease. Now, starting from 2014, that investment stalled. And as a result, the number of deaths also stalled, and so are the cases. If you look at the boxes on the right side, uh, that is summarizing the number of cases and death in 2021. And they come from the World Malaria Report of, the, of 2022, which is the latest that we have. Now, globally, in 2021, 247 million cases were reported and 619,000 deaths were reported. Again, the highest burden of the disease in, is in Africa. More than 95% of all the cases and deaths, they come uh, from this region. And uh, if you look at absolute numbers, we're talking about 468,000 deaths of children. Next slide. Now, because of that, we really need new tools uh, to, you know, combat the disease. Uh, and one of those tools is uh, vaccines. Now, in October 2021, WHO recommended the first malaria vaccine, uh, which is RTSS, to be used for the prevention of plasmodium falciparum malaria and children living in regions with moderate to high transmission. Now, the evidence for that was collected from the pilot implementation program that I've already alluded to. That is started from 2017 and is expected to end in December 2023. Now, the actual administration of the malaria vaccine RTSS started in 2019 in three countries. That's Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi and it continues until the end of the year. Now, results and lessons that uh, uh, were uh, obtained from the pilot implementation, they informed the recommendation that was given by WHO in 2021. Now, beyond the recommendation, the other countries that we call non-MVIP countries, countries that are not pilot countries, 
are now considering to roll out the vaccine and we will look at the progress and challenges and opportunities regarding that. Next slide. Now let's look at the actual recommendation. Uh, I'm going to read it the way it is. WHO recommends the RTSS malaria vaccine be used for the prevention, prevention of beef for superior malaria in children living in regions with moderate to high transmission as defined by WHO. The RTSS malaria vaccine should be provided in a schedule of four doses in children starting from five months of age for the reduction of the malaria disease and burden. Countries may consider providing the malaria vaccine seasonally with a five dose strategy in areas with higher seasonal malaria or areas with perennial malaria transmission with the seasonal peaks. The malaria vaccine introduction should be considered in the context of comprehensive national uh, malaria control tools. That is, it is not to be used as a standalone intervention. Now, on the right side of the slide, you see different uh, links, uh, which will take you to uh, resources regarding the vaccine. Uh, we encourage you to visit the links so that you get enlightened more uh, about uh, this vaccine. Next slide. Now, further details on the, on the recommendation regarding the malaria vaccine schedule. The first dose, is administered starting from five months of age. There is a minimum interval of five weeks between doses. The primary series comprises of three doses. And the fourth dose after the primary series is given approximately 12 to uh, 18 months. And that is meant to prolong the duration of protection. There is flexibility. The recommendation provide uh, for flexibility in the church, and that is meant to optimize delivery. As an example, uh, countries may consider to align the fourth dose with other vaccines in the second year of, of life. Children who begin their vaccination series should complete the four dose schedule for maximum protection. Now, there is an optional schedule, like it's been said, for settings with highly seasonal malaria or perennial malaria uh, with the seasonal peaks. Now, that uh, schedule uh, is meant to, uh, to make sure that the occurrence of the disease is, ma is maximized so that the, 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 the vaccine produces highest uh, impact. So the timing, is such that the three uh, series of doses th is, that is provided monthly, they're provided just before the peak season. So that before the peak season, there is maximum protection afforded by the, uh, the, the, the vaccine. And then additional doses are provided annually prior to the peak season, up to a maximum of five doses. Three primary series, just before the peak season. And then the other will be given annually uh, up to a total of five doses. Countries that choose a seasonal deployment uh, strategy are strongly encouraged to document their experience because we still need to learn more uh, on this option. Next slide. Now, what are the product characteristics of this WHO pre-qualified uh, malaria vaccine? It's an adjuvanted uh, vaccine. Uh, it has got uh, an antigen and an adjuvant. The antigen is uh, lyophilized and the uh, adjuvant is a liquid. Now, they are stored in two separate vials which are clipped together to reduce the chance of reconstitution error. The adjuvant uh, is with a green ring to identify it as such. And the antigen has got a red ring, that which you see uh, on, the right, on the left side of the slide. Now you could get more information about this product uh, through the link that is indicated there, the first bullet point. Uh, 
and we urge you to visit the link and get more information about the vaccine. It's an injectable vaccine. And once you reconstitute it, the vial contains two doses of the vaccine, and those must be used within, this, uh, within the first six hours or discarded at the end of a session, whichever comes first. The shelf life of the vaccine is 36 months at a storage temperature of uh, between uh, plus two degrees centigrade and plus eight degrees centigrade. This vaccine is freeze sensitive and it's also light sensitive. It has got a vaccine biomonitor, which you see there uh, on the vial for the advent. Uh, the packaging is uh, uh, very uh, convenient. Uh, you have 100 vials per pack and the volume is about 9.92 centimeter cube per dose which is comparable to other vaccines in the routine immunization system. It can be co-administered with pentavalent, uh, OPV, measles, rubella, yellow fever, uh, rotavirus, and pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Next slide. Now a little bit on the results and lessons learned from the pilot. Now, uh, when the, the three countries, Malawi, Ghana, and Kenya, started administering the vaccine in, in, uh, in 2019, the areas within the country were subdivided into three parts. First, they were uh, areas that had got nothing to do with the vaccine at that time, and they are indicated as non-MVP districts uh, for Kenya, their counties. So non-MVIP counties. Now, those areas that were implementing and are still implementing the vaccine were subdivided into two. The green one, they were they, they are called MVIP vaccinating districts or counties. Now the pink one, they initially served as, as comparator districts. So they were not initially vaccinating. But after WHO issued a recommendation, policy recommendation for broader use of the vaccine, these areas started uh, implementing uh, the malaria vaccine and they are now administering the vaccine. And so expansion, we are calling them expansion areas. Expansion started in Malawi in November last year. Ghana and Kenya started this year, Ghana in February and Kenya in March. Next slide. Now, the malaria vaccine is progressing very well uh, from the time when it started in 2019. Uh, we have supported the ministries and they have been able in those three countries to administer more than 4.5 million vaccine doses. And they have been able to reach more than 1.5 million uh, children. And those are the children who have received at least a dose of the vaccine. Next slide. Now, going to the individual countries, Malawi on top, uh, Ghana in the middle, and Kenya at the bottom. Now, if you look at uh, the graph, you will see uh, the dotted uh, broken line, which is representing the target population. Then you will see a green line, which is representing uh, Penta 3, the third dose of pet Penta Valent. And we're using this uh, as a proxy for the performance of the uh, uh, of the immunization system. And so we're comparing RTSS to this. Uh, RTSS1 is represented by the navy blue line. And then uh, there is um, RTSS3, which is represented by the blue line. And then there is uh, the gold line, uh, solid, which is representing uh, measles and rubella one. And then there is the broken uh, uh, gold line, which is rep representing measles and rubella two. And then lastly, there is RTSS4, which is on the represented by the gray uh, curve. Now, if you, you look at Malawi, Malawi started at a lower level uh, in April 2019, and then it steadily increased the coverage the malaria vaccine. And within the first 18 months, 
they had reached to levels similar to those of Penta, and at one time actually going beyond uh, Penta 3, uh, which is very uh, incredible. And you will remember that this was at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, yes, uh, this is good performance and Malawi has continued to maintain more or less uh, same coverage. But I must say that uh, uh, in, in the beginning of 2022, uh, there was a dip that you see there in uh, broken, uh, uh, dotted red line uh, that corresponds to a tropical storm that hit the country and the uh, systems were affected by that, including uh, routine immunization. Then the country worked hard to bring down, uh, to bring up coverage to where it is expected to be. Now, if you look at uh, Ghana, Ghana started at a high point. Uh, they had a lot of uh, uh, community engagement uh, at the beginning, uh, pre-launch, and they have maintained uh, that coverage, as you see uh, on the graph. But again, there has been a few challenges. Uh, in 2020, uh, you see there a dip in the coverage of the vaccine. Uh, that is related to stroke out that uh, emanated to the disturbances uh, brought about by COVID-19 pandemic. Now, at the end of 2022, uh, uh, there were also challenges there. Uh, again, another stock out uh, involving a variety of antigens. And the, that is not related to COVID-19. Uh, and the country is working to rectify the situation. And we now see that uh, coverage is coming up again. For Kenya, Kenya started at a very high point, as you see there, actually the first dose of RTSS going beyond the target population. That is because the edge of target there uh, was what we call expanded edge group. Uh, that was six up to 12 months. And so uh, the number of children uh, was more than uh, the target population. And again, after that was exhaust, exhausted, the coverage came to where it's expected to, to be. And it has been maintained uh, ever since, except for the time when there were ethic worker strikers in the country, 2020, 2021. Uh, and uh, now Kenya is doing uh, uh, very well. Now, if you look at the quickly, uh, the tables on the left side, uh, of the slide, you will see the average coverage for the uh, different years, starting from 2020 to 2022. You will see that the countries have maintained uh, good coverage. Uh, the coverage for the fourth dose as a trend, you see it increasing for all the three countries. Again, to summarize this, uh, to have such a performance for a vaccine that is being introduced for the first time in routine immun immunization, uh, speaks to the resilience of the system and the acceptance of the vaccine by both caregivers and healthcare workers. Next slide, please. Now, this slide is summarizing findings from the pilot uh, 20, uh, 24 months after first vaccination in those three countries. Now, the the results are grouped into four uh, categories. First, feasibility. Now, vaccine introduction, uh, the results found out that vaccine introduction is feasible with good uptake and coverage through the routine systems. No impact on uptake of other vaccines, including ITNs and the care-seeking behavior. Regarding safety, the vaccine is safe. No vaccine signals. Uh, were identified and none has been identified so far, over uh, 3 million doses provided. Now, regarding the impact of the vaccine, the vaccine introduction resulted in a substantial reduction in severe malaria and all cause mortality in children age eligible to receive the vaccine, uh, even when introduced in areas with good ITN use and access to care. Uh, there was a 32% reduction in hospitalized severe malaria, 
And during 26 and 38 months after vaccine introduction, data show a reduction in all cause mortality uh, of about 10%. And regarding equity, the vaccine is reaching children who are not using other forms of prevention, such as insecticide-treated nets, uh, increasing access to malaria prevention uh, intervention to more than 90%, as we're going to see in the next slide. Next, okay, thank you. So this is what I have just uh, said, that it increases equity. So the data that you see come from uh, a midline built household uh, survey among children aged 12 to 23 months. That was conducted in Ghana, and uh, that was in November 2020. Uh, 18 months had passed since the vaccine was introduced in the country. Now you will see that uh, those that were using ITNs were 69%, uh, and those that were not using ITNs were 31%. Now, uh, those that uh, had received uh, the first dose, at least the first dose of RTSS yes, were 77%. And the out uh, fifty five percent uh, had uh, used uh, were, were using both ITN and were vaccinated. The group that you see there, they had uh, they were using both ITNs uh, and the uh, were vaccinated. Uh, Twenty two percent uh, were not using ITNs but were vaccinated. So again, you see that uh, this 22% uh, were not covered, were not protected by ITNs, but they had a vaccine uh, as a form of protection. And so again, the vaccine extends equity covering uh, children that are not covered by other means of protection against malaria. The message I want to give here is that the vaccine should not be used as a standalone uh, intervention, despite this finding. Uh, we still give the same message that the vaccine should be implemented as part of a package of interventions, not as a standalone intervention. So if you layer uh, ITNs and the vaccine, you reach about 91% of the children with these two interventions. So only 9% is left out, the one that you see there on the right side of the slide, uh, without coverage of an ITN or a, a vaccine. So that's the group that uh, you may wish to think about, you know, to cover uh, because they are not covered by e either of the two interventions. Next slide. So we've been working with PATH, which is a, a US-based NGO, and PATH have been leading uh, qualitative and cost-effectiveness effective effectiveness studies. And I'm sharing a snapshot of the results from those studies. Uh, the malaria vaccine is acceptable to both the uh, service providers and the target population. Uh, secondly, during the pilot implementations, trust increased uh, and facilitated vaccine uptake. Initially, parents reported trust in the health system and vaccines in general, and later they reported a specific trust to the RTSS malaria vaccine. Uh, three, the additional resources required for the introduction and delivery of the vaccine were seen as broadly comparable to other recently introduced vaccines. Uh, at uh, $10 US dollars per dose, in a four dose schedule, the vaccine remains cost effective for perennial transmission settings with greater than 10% uh, uh, plasmodium falciparum uh, uh, prevalence among children aged two to 10 years uh, with, a, uh, with median estimated cost of uh, $150 to $200 per daily averted in updated models. Preliminary analysis showed also cost effective 
uh, cost effectiveness in highly seasonal settings. Countries will need to consider GAVI co-financing policy and affordability of, of the vaccine uh, before they make the, uh, the, the decision to uh, introduce the vaccine. Modeling pr uh, predictions indicate a significant public health impact across a wide range of settings. Next slide. Now, uh, the WHO recommendation for seasonal delivery using a five-dose uh, schedule is based on the findings uh, showing high efficacy in areas of high seasonal transmission. Those findings were published by uh, Chandramon uh, and his colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2021. And this is just a snapshot of the results from uh, that, uh, 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 that study. Uh, RTSS efficacy uh, from using a seasonal strategy uh, was conducted in uh, Burkina Faso and Mali, like I said, in 2021. The strategy is taking advantage of a high vaccine efficacy during the first three to six months after vaccination. Now, the, it, it was found that uh, seasonal vaccination uh, was not inferior to four rounds of seasonal malaria chemo prevention in protecting against uh, clinical uh, malaria. Uh, Seasonal uh, malaria chemo prevention uh, prevents 75% of clinical and severe uh, malaria cases. Uh, that one we knew before the, uh, the study. Now, if you go down bullet number three, combined intervention of RTSS and seasonal malaria chemo prevention is superior to either alone, uh, to either alone, alone, to either alone of the two uh, interventions. So if you combine uh, seasonal malaria chemo prevention and RTSS, you get a better results uh, than either of the individual uh, interventions. Now, could you go back quickly? Now the efficacy against different endpoints is, sh is shown there. Uh, efficacy against clinical malaria, uh, 63%. Efficacy against severe malaria, host hospitalization, 71%. Efficacy against severe malaria anemia, 68%. Uh, against blood transfusion, 65%. Against all cause death, excluding injuries, 52%. And efficacy against death and malaria, 73%. Uh, Next slide. And this is my last slide. So. The, as a next step, the MVP results and lessons learned have to be disseminated as uh, wide as, uh, as possible. Now, plan for there is a plan for wide dissemination in the countries uh, regionally and globally through presentations, uh, scientific symposia, regional conference, and like I said in the beginning, uh, we would appreciate such opportunities including uh, you know, webinars like this. Uh, many lessons learned incorporated into vaccine introduction guide and related tools and mater uh, materials. So we have developed a vaccine introduction guide to assist and guide countries that are introducing the vaccine and non MVIP countries. And the, within that, uh, there are lessons uh, from which countries could learn. Uh, we're also working on publications. Uh, and then support uh, the country, across country engagement with ministries of health and partners from uh, pilot countries, providing opportunities to incorporate lessons learned in pilot countries into new vaccine introduction. So we've been holding workshops and uh, to assist countries uh, with GAVI applications for support for the introduction of the vaccine. And during those workshops, we make sure that MVP countries are there to share their experiences. Uh, that's all from me. I will now invite my colleague, Elian, to take you from here. Elian, please. Thank you very much, uh, MacGyver. And also from my side, thank you so much for the uh, to the organizers for having us. It's really a, a pleasure and we're really grateful for the opportunity. 
So in the next few minutes, I will talk about the pro the malaria vaccine rollout, the progress to date, challenges, few opportunities, and next steps. And I'll try to do this quite quickly. I realize um, we are a little bit behind on time. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to leave a bit time on, uh, at the end for, for questions. So um, the scientific advance, uh, advances and the WHO recommendations that um, Dr. Magafu has uh, talked about were, of course, key milestones. But as we have seen with other new vaccines, this is not in itself a guarantee that the vaccine gets in children's arms and can save lives. So oftentimes, um, resource poor countries find it difficult to afford a new vaccine. And um, sometimes these new vaccines can be quite um, uh, pricey when entering the market in the beginning. So shortly after the WHO recommendation for use, there was a very important step um, uh, decided by Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, to approve a malaria vaccine program um, many of you will be familiar with Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. It's the, the, the largest um, supporter of vaccines in lower and lower middle income countries. And over the last 20 plus years has really made a, a huge difference in terms of enabling access for um, lower income countries to new and life-saving vaccines. So it was a, a key um, fundamental mi milestone when Gavi decided to also support a malaria vaccine. And RTSS is the first one, but the Gavi program would also enable other new vaccines to be supported once they are WHO recommended, uh, recommended for use. And the Gavi support includes um, contribution to the vaccine cost and injection supplies, also some financial support for introduction activities. Countries do need to contribute to the cost through what Gavi calls a co-financing policy. But for this vaccine, given that um, the initial price is quite high. They approved an exceptional time-limited approach with the aim to really facilitate affordability and uptake. For example, the lowest income countries pay 20 cents per dose. And shortly after this announcement, and since Gavi opened formally the possibility for countries to apply for support in July 2022, Gavi reports unprecedented levels of demand for this new vaccine. More than 28 countries have expressed an interest in applying and introducing the vaccine. 20 countries have already done so with an application to Gavi. Of these, 14 countries have already been approved to receive support. These are all from, from the African continent and four applications are currently being reviewed. There are um, additional opportunities, uh, usually three to four times a year when countries can apply for Gavi support. So it's a, almost a, a rolling basis. Interestingly, now the next step for these 14 countries that got approved, um, there is a supply limitation. I'll speak about this in more detail. And so the next key step here is um, for the supply allocation decisions to be made and communicated. And then these countries can start to plan for introduction, um, uh, probably towards uh, first, second quarter next year. So one of the key challenges we're facing right now is that the initial vaccine supply is insufficient to meet this very high demand. So you see on, on the left side, the um, areas where the vaccine would be recommended for use, moderate to high transmission uh, areas. We know that more than 25 million children are born each year in these regions. So predominantly on the African continent, but there are also some pockets of, of high transmissions outside of Africa. I mentioned the large number of countries that have already um, expressed interest. And then on the supply side, things are more complicated. We have one vaccine that is recommended. It's produced by a single manufacturer at the moment. Um, there is limited production capacity due to uh, operation in a quite old facility. Um, and there is a, a, an ongoing effort to transfer the technology, the product, to another um, company so that uh, ultimately supply can increase. But at the moment, we're comparing 18 million doses that are available and committed for the next three years with a high demand, um, likely in the order of more than 80 to 100 million doses per year. So a clear mismatch. And the initial price, I should mention, is um, currently 9.3 euros per dose. And we, we would expect that price to, to come down 
um, in the future as the market expands. So it is a high priority for WHO and for Gavi Alliance partners to really um, address these market issues because right now the malaria vaccine market is not, not really healthy with a, with a single supplier, short um, a shortage of supply and relatively high price. So the objectives really are to increase supply, lower the cost and create a, an environment for innovative additional products. The two main avenues in the short to medium term um, to get to more supply. One is, as I mentioned, a, a product transfer of RTSS to a, another company, Bharat Biotech in India. This is expected um, in a couple of years to lead to larger production capacities. And then um, a second avenue is the potential entry of a second malaria vaccine. The most advanced is R21 matrix M. It's currently in phase three clinical trials and WHO has started the expert review of, of this product. And as I mentioned, we would hope and expect that uh, the price will come down over time as supply increases. So in anticipation of the um, mismatch between the need and the limited supply in initial years, WHO was tasked with the very difficult task to help develop a framework for the allocation of limited supply. And the purpose really was to develop a mechanism or a framework that would allow um, in a fair, transparent principles and equity driven um, way to allocate the, the limited number of doses. So what you see here is the summary of the key principles in terms of the governance principles, the actual allocation principles and additional considerations for how this limited supply should be used. One key consideration is to ensure continu continuity in access to an established immunization program. And so this relates to the three pilot countries and the framework ensures that these countries can continue to provide malaria vaccine services to the children and the areas where the vaccine has already been rolled out as part of the pilot program. So that was a key a priority. And then for the next set of countries, the first allocation principle is to provide the vaccine to areas where the needs are greatest. And in other words, this means areas where the malaria disease burden in children and the risk of death are, are highest. And I'll show you this um, on, on subsequent slides. So in order to um, create a methodology and um, a, 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 an approach for countries to identify these highest need areas, we proposed um, a, a new classification of malaria prevalence combined with all cause under five mortality rates. And this is meant to serve as a proxy for need. Um, malaria prevalence, or in some cases, countries used incidence levels, is a measure of the trans uh, transmission intensity and the burden. And then all cause under five mortality adds a measure of, um, of need because higher mortality indicates um, less access to care and prevention, so increases the need for um, additional protection. And as you can see here, the category one, what we call the greatest need category one areas, combine very high levels of malaria prevalence at the district level, with very high all cause under five mortality rates. And so the proposal in the framework is that each country identifies these areas based on uh, best available local data. And then with limited supply, each country would start initially in those greatest need areas. And given this methodology, we are able to compare across countries and ensure that the limited vaccine doses go really to the children um, across countries living in those greatest need areas. So this framework was developed last year and finalized. And we've now, with the demand from countries and the first applications to Gavi, we've seen this framework being operationalized. So these maps show the stratification done by the country teams, uh, usually national malaria control programs in collaboration with the vaccine programs, um, they have developed, using that same methodology, the maps and identified high-need areas. 
So these are the, the dark purple areas for Mozambique and, and DR Congo. Uh, the color scheme is slightly different, but um, the, the darker areas represent the, the highest need areas. And so one, one big takeaway is there is a lot of burden in, in many of these countries. And so um, unfortunately, with the current limited supply, we were not able to meet all the purple highest need areas. So the framework foresees one additional dimension, which is a, a solidarity cap, and it limits the number of vaccine doses that each country can get initially so that a larger number of countries can start um, vaccine use at the subnational level, um, rather than limiting it to a, a few countries. And so um, the next step for the approved countries is now to um, wait for the confirmation of supply availability. We already know that unfortunately some countries will have to wait until more supply becomes available. Others will be able to start at the subnational level in those highest need areas. Um, I would like to talk now about um, a different topic, uh, but another opportunity that comes with this vaccine. You have heard about the schedule. Um, this is a somewhat unconventional new schedule for a for a, um, um, a vaccine for children. It usually starts at five months of age. We heard there's some flexibility. Uh, some pilot countries started at six months of age, but basically one option is to provide um, the first dose at five months, then the second dose at six months, third dose at seven months. Then there's a little gap between the third and the fourth dose. And in this example, the fourth dose is given at 18 months in order to um, leverage an already existing immunization schedule for measles second dose. And in this example, uh, a meningococcal A vaccine. And as you can see, this may present challenges because these are new visits for vaccination. But we've seen in the pilot countries that the demand from caregivers is really um, quite high. And so attendance, even though these are new visits, is expected to be um, high. And so they can be used as opportunities to catch up um, missed vaccines in the, in the, um, for other uh, infant vaccines that are given earlier in a child's age. Um, and then also, of course, there are other um, health interventions that are meant to take place over that same time period. For example, vitamin A is often given at six months of age or 12 months of age. So these additional visits that are quite attractive for the malaria vaccine can really be used as, a, as an entry point to ensure that other interventions are also provided. And it doesn't stop at vitamin A. These are the time points where they, there should also be growth monitoring, um, some time points uh, can be used for bed net distribution, dewarming, and so on. So it really provides the opportunity for additional touch points in a, in a child's life. And then the fourth dose is given in the second year of life. So this is usually a, a bit more um, challenging time to get children back. And from the data that MacGyver showed, you've seen that we also saw this for, for the malaria vaccine. So it's not a given, but it does create opportunities to expand this second year of life platform with an attractive vaccine. Um, briefly, um, we were asked to also uh, give a, a, a brief outlook of the malaria vaccine pipeline. So this shows um, a, a, um, a screenshot of something that is available on the WHO website in the Global Observatory on Health R&D. It's um, uh, the results of a review that was conducted by WHO last year that assessed the um, status of malaria vaccine clinical development. And as you can see, at that point, there were um, 89 malaria vaccines uh, reported to have been in clinical development at some point in time. Of those, 29 were um, assessed to be active, so in some form of clinical phase one, two, three, or beyond. And um, so that the pipeline is quite healthy, but if you have a closer look, we see that about two thirds of those products are still in phase one clinical trials. About one third is in phase two, and we have one product, oops, sorry, 
We have one product um, that is now in phase three. I mentioned this, R21 Matrix M, um, for which WHO has initiated the expert review and which um, could potentially be found to be safe, efficacious, and uh, programmatically suitable, recommended for broader use um, sometime in the future. And we talked already about uh, the, the only vaccine that is currently recommended for use. You have the link here for um, all the details. It's quite interactive. So if you're interested in, in specific vaccine platforms or, um, or adjuvant um, um, uh, techniques, uh, the, the uh, website is really quite rich. So in conclusion, the availability of a first malaria vaccine is really a, a major scientific breakthrough. It's the first vaccine against the parasite, and it has taken decades of research to get to this point. We've seen in the pilots that um, there was high uptake and the well-established EPI delivery system really helps to um, get high uptake relatively quickly and therefore also achieve high impact in a real life setting without having to um, uh, uh, develop a parallel delivery system. The high levels of demand are now also confirmed in other countries by um, country leaders who have come forward with the intention to introduce the vaccine. The vaccine provides opportunities for catch up of missed vaccine doses and other interventions. The key challenge at this point in time is the supply limitations and also to some extent the initial high price. Um, there are efforts on the way, and it's a big priority for partners to make the, the malaria vaccine market more healthy in terms of increased supply, reduced price, and uh, ultimately more products um, available. And then finally, a second malaria vaccine is being reviewed right now by WHO, and if recommended for use, um, this could complement the rollout of the first malaria vaccine, and it could help close the gap between supply and demand, and ultimately uh, really help reduce child illness and death from malaria. So with this, we'd like to thank you all, and we are available for questions. Well, well thank, you. thank you very oh, thank much. You. Uh, Sorry, go ahead, please. Oh, thank you very much for, um, for these excellent presentations. And uh, I think what we'll do now is, um, is maybe Alian and uh, Dr. and uh, Dr. Magafo, if you can uh, turn on your video if it's working, so we can take some of the questions. Um, a couple of um, things, uh, questions that came up uh, from uh, people who have been uh, uh, listening to this um, webinar is how long is the is it uh, estimated that the protection will last? if a child gets fully the full uh, schedule of vaccination. I guess it's a question to either of you. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, uh, it's a good question. Um, for a child who takes the, the all the four doses, the fourth uh, dose at the moment in the three countries is taken at a, uh, tw either 22 months of age for Malawi and then uh, 24 months of age for Ghana uh, and Kenya. It's, a, the, it's expected that a child who completes uh, four, vac uh, four vaccine doses, they will be able to go through the uh, most dangerous time of their life, that is below five years of age protected. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, immunity wanes, but it does not wane, uh, you know, to the extent of leaving the child uh, not protected before they go uh, beyond the most dangerous uh, part of their life. That's five months. And again, I want to emphasize that this has to be taken in the context of other preventive measures. Uh, this is not a standalone intervention. It has to be implemented with other method, methods of control and prevention of malaria, uh, depending on the area. As you may know, the Global Malaria Program, uh, GMP, is now uh, implementing a strategy which is called 
subnational tailoring. So interventions are tailored to the uh, need, disease burden of the of the area. So yes, uh, to answer your question, uh, the immunity wanes over time. But if a child completes all four doses, they will be uh, protected beyond the uh, most dangerous uh, part of their lives. Thank you very much. And I, I think it's your message that this is a combination. Prevention is very important. The need for both the vaccines and the other measures, including ITN, is, is very important as part of the counseling, of, obviously, uh, to the parents of these children. Uh, that's a very critical message. A, a question came up about a bit of confusion. Maybe you can clarify a bit the use of the vaccine in settings where seasonal uh, malaria is the suggestion that uh, that an additional dose be given prior to every season until the child is beyond the, at the highest the period of highest risk, or is it just four doses overall? Okay. I, I missed the question. What is the, the seasonal, if you can clarify the seasonal um, uh, the 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 regimen that's recommended for uh, children in settings with seasonal malaria? Okay, so regarding seasonal vaccination, yeah, the the point is that the vaccination has to be timed. Like we have said, the first three uh, you know doses, the primary series, they provide uh, significant protection. So before a child gets into that season, okay, uh, the peak season, uh, where the risk is high, transmission is high and the risk is high, they receive those three doses, primary doses. Now, uh, that is going to take them through that season in that year. Mm -hmm. Now, when another year comes before that season, they receive another dose. And then another year comes, the year that follows that, they receive another dose, the 50 dose. Mm -hmm. And then they should be, you know, uh, now beyond the most risky period of their life. Yeah, thank you. That's very clear. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And maybe going back to you, uh, Dr. Fear, uh, you mentioned, of course, the potential and excitement about potentially another vaccine, the R21 vaccine. And a question regarding the, the regimen, the, the, the timing for the dosing with that vaccine. Uh, is it more consistent with the current vaccination schedule or does it have a follow a similar uh, uh, schedule to this vaccine here? Um, so it is being um, assessed in the phase three clinical trial with a, with a similar schedule. So it, it starts at five months of age as well. Um, they do go beyond. Uh, so for RTSS, the clinical trial was done in children from five to 17 months of age at um, the first vaccine contact. Um, the R21 is being tested um, in children from five months to 36 months of age. So a slightly wider range um, of, of initial contact. But we would expect the schedule will be um, similar uh, in the sense that it will not align with the infant schedule, um, where typically the vaccine, uh, the early vaccines would be given at six weeks, 10 weeks, 14 weeks of age. And that is due, um, this schedule was tested for the RTSS vaccine and um, as part of the phase three trials, but it was found to have lower efficacy levels, quite significantly lower. And so this um, schedule was not recommended by WHO. Thank you, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, as you can see from all the questions uh, from, uh, from our audience, there's a lot of excitement about uh, as to when other countries will gain access to, um, to this vaccine. Um, so it's um, encouraging about the, the several countries that were approved by Gavi. When do you anticipate that these other countries would start receiving um, doses of this vaccine? Yeah, um, so the next critical step following the, the approval is the supply allocation. And so that's being finalized mm -hmm. right now. And we can expect in the, next, um, in the next weeks to have information available about which of these approved countries will also get an initial supply allocation. And then that triggers a lot of additional steps. For example, it triggers the, um, the Gavi funding uh, disbursement. It triggers the, um, the actual supply detailed planning. And um, each country will have to start the planning process then at the country level in terms of um, health worker trainings, communication material development, social mobilization, 
uh, maybe cold chain upgrades and so on. And we would expect the, the first countries to receive vaccine uh, probably by the end of this year and then to be able to start vaccinating in um, early next year. That's wonderful. Thank you. So essentially, you're encouraging those countries to start the planning now uh, so they can start as soon as possible. That's that's very exciting. And maybe a final question as we're running out of time is uh, there's been a lot of concern about, uh, as you know, with COVID-19 vaccination and uh, vaccine hesitancy and, and so on and so forth and a spillover to some hesitancy uh, also for childhood vaccination. Uh, it's it's very reassuring to see the uh, the uptake, which is uh, quite uh, high, of this vaccine. Have you encountered any uh, evidence of vaccine uh, hesitancy as it relates, or any concerns regarding the safety of this vaccine in particular uh, in the pilot countries? Yes, uh, when we started, uh, there were rumors uh, in uh, the MVP countries and countries supported with the WHO and partners worked hard to address those uh, rumors. Uh, with the time, uh, confidence was built and the, you know, as you saw on the graphs, uptake started increasing. Uh, and the, you know, the surprising thing is that uh, even at the peak of the pandemic, you know, uptake remained, remained uh, you know, mm -hmm. relatively high. Uh, which is very much encouraging. And so the the answer is it was there, especially in the beginning, but, uh, you know, as time passed on, uh, we tended to see less and less of, of, of it. Uh, countries that are preparing to introduce the vaccine, they have to prepare a communication strategy, uh, which, you know, takes care of such things as uh, rumors and hesitance. And so we supported them to prepare for that so that when they start, then uh, they have a plan uh, on board to address such, such issues. That's great. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you both for excellent presentation on this very exciting uh, new uh, vaccine and um, which has a tremendous potential to save the lives of literally millions of children around the world. Uh, thank you for your hard work and thank you for the update today. And uh, just want to assure the audience that we will be sharing uh, the slides as well as the presentation on our website uh, for all to review. May I have the next slide, please? So I'd like to again uh, thank you all for participating today and um, and uh, here are our next grand rounds. Wanted to share with you to please join us again on Tuesday, June 20th at 9 a.m. Eastern US time uh, for a webinar on uh, refugee health. Please put that on your uh, agendas, please. And thank you again and all the best. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Have thank good, you. Take good care. Bye bye. Bye-bye.